Hello, and welcome to today's special event, The Latest Threat to Your Endpoint Security, Cryptojacking, brought to you by Zip Davis and Cisco. I am Karen Bannon, and I will be your moderator. We have just a few quick notes before we begin. Slides will advance automatically throughout the event. In addition, the console you're looking at is customizable. This means you can move and resize any of the windows you see open as well as explore the widgets at the bottom of your screen. For instance, please take a look at the Additional Resources tab, which is on the bottom right widget, where you will find plenty of information related to this topic. We'd also like the event to be as interactive as possible, so at this time we invite you to ask any questions you might have using that question box on the left side of your screen. We're going to get to as many questions as we can towards the end of the event. And finally, an on-demand presentation will be available after our event, and you will receive a link via email. So, earlier this year, 4,000 websites across the globe were compromised. The sites were set up for cryptojacking, including those belonging to various governments, such as uscourts.gov and others from Australia, the UK, and Scotland. Cryptojacking is definitely becoming a trend. For example, you know a trend has gone mainstream when the U.S. government feels the need to highlight it. So on June 7th, for example, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission posted a blog that detailed what cryptojacking is and provided a link for consumers to report suspected instances of the newest hacking technique. And in that blog post, Jason Adler, the FTC's Assistant Director of the Midwest Region, reports, <clears throat> and this is a quote, Cryptojacking scams have continued to evolve, and they don't even need you to install anything. Scammers can use malicious code embedded in a website or an ad to infect your device. Then they can help themselves to your device's processor without you even knowing. And that's a close quote. Scary stuff, and that's exactly why during today's event, our experts will discuss cryptojacking and its tangible business risks. Not only how to detect it, but also how to prevent it and address it in the context of your endpoint security controls. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our experts, Kevin Beaver and Andrew S. Baker. Kevin Beaver is an independent information security consultant, writer, and professional speaker with Atlanta, Georgia-based Principal Logic. With more than 29 years of experience in IT and 23 in information security, Kevin specializes in performing network and application security assessments, security program reviews, and general consulting to help businesses minimize their IT risks take the pain out of compliance, and uncheck the checkboxes that keep creating a false sense of security. Kevin has written or co-written 12 books on information security, including the best-selling Hacking for Dummies and the Practical Guide to HIPAA Privacy and Security Compliance. So Andrew is a virtual CIO, small business owner, and technologist, as well as president and founder of Brainwave Consulting, an independent consultancy delivering technology-based business solutions for the SMB market, specializing in infrastructure design, management, information security, and IT operations. Andrew has more than 25 years' experience in IT and almost two decades working with IT security and compliance. And finally, this is me, and I am a total tech geek and completely excited to be the moderator today. So with that, let's get started. So today, we're going to do things a little bit differently than maybe other webinars that you've recently been to. So we're going to have a conversation, and we'd like you to be a part of that conversation. So I'd again like to invite you to ask any questions you may have as we go. And you can also uh, submit questions that you may not pertain specifically to the slide we're talking to, but we'll make sure that we get you answers to that as well. So let's start our event with a simple question for both of our speakers. So what is cryptocurrency? And um, why don't we go alphabetically and we'll start out with, um, I guess we'll start out with Andrew Baker. Andrew? Thank you, Karen. I guess I win the alphabetics no matter way, which way we do this. Um, cryptocurrency is virtual money. It's kind of like monopoly money, but it's digital money that is created from some serious math and uh, basically you put your computers to use solving serious math problems and that allows you to create a currency that is shared that is not managed by a central authority um, and that can be used for a variety of other um, technology purposes besides just currency i think it's interesting that cryptocurrency is gaining 
and has gained such popularity because I think it, it sort of takes um, takes the government out of it, and it, and you basically have this ledger system where everyone has a specific idea um, of of what they have and who did what and who sent what. Um, Kevin, do you agree? I agree, and and thanks by the way for the alphabetical thing. I, I like this uh, this approach. I, all my life, I've always been towards the top, so it's good to have someone right above me. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, uh, Andrew explained it very well. It's basically digital money, you know, and it's it's based around a, a system of trust, and you know that that trust it's basically there because people agree that on on that system of trust, you know it. Cryptocurrency, and, and, and I think it's important to, to sort of wrap your head around the, this whole concept of cryptocurrency because it, it, it ties right into, obviously, what we're talking about with crypto jacking, but it, it functions on blockchain technology, which is basically a, a public record of all transactions. And, and the, the, the whole crypto mining concept is using uh, computers to mine this cryptocurrency, which is in effect, like Andrew said, the solving of math problems. It involves the blocks, and then you're adding, adding these blocks to the public blockchain, and, and so on. So it's, uh, it's 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 new, it's sexy, and everyone wants in on it. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's becoming more and more volatile as we're seeing uh, in in recent weeks. But, but yeah, and, and Karen, you you hit on a good point. It's it's. It's good for us, and I guess it's bad for governments because it's it, it's it, it basically takes the middleman, the the intermediary, out of the equation, and it allows us just to have our own form of currency to pay for and to do whatever we want. So, it, and it, and the thing is, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad, as we'll talk about today. And it can't be um, it can't be seized, and it's very difficult. If, if for once somebody gets cryptocurrency, it's it's pretty much impossible to go ahead and, and take it back. Right, at, at least at, at this point and as far as we know, and I, I guess that remains to be seen. But, yeah, I, I do think that's a benefit of it. And why hackers love it so much. So yeah, let's see. Yeah. So money. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Money go by ahead. the people for the people. Money by exactly. the people for the people. <laughs> there you go. So uh, – so, Kevin, your turn now. How do you define cryptojacking? And I think I touched on it briefly at the beginning of the introduction, but give us a little bit more information, and, and then we'll we'll get a follow-up from Andrew. Yeah, it's it's more of the dark side of cryptocurrency and, and crypto mining that it, it, it affects IT and security, but it can affect your business as a whole. Uh, you know, it, it's something that a lot of people don't understand, and therefore they don't know what to do about it. Um, cryptojacking is it's basically when when uh, an attacker uses his tools and his processes to uh, basically compromise your system and, and commandeer uh, its resources in order to mine cryptocurrency. So, um, you know, some of it's considered legitimate, some of it's considered uh, 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 criminal, you know, criminal activity, um, you know, that that that's the thing with all this the the crypto jacking and we'll get more into the details i know but it's right now it's there's not a there's not a good option to either opt in or opt out of this crypto mining process so it becomes a burden on your users and uh, and on your business i think especially the sort of how you mentioned that you know this is a ledger system so with cryptocurrency mining um, basically that the your resources are being used to do that difficult mathematics uh, uh, that Andrew mentioned um, to actually add the, the cryptocurrency to the blockchain digital ledger so Andrew would you like to add anything um, about crypto jacking and and why it's a uh, yeah how yep. we would define it yep. so uh, crypto, crypto jacking is where I surreptitiously get you to mine coins for me. Um, it's, it's, and, and it's an interesting form of theft because I'm stealing your time, right? You're not losing any physical asset. I'm not taking your money specifically, right? Obviously, if I use your resources, there, there's some of that. But 
I'm stealing your time. And some of the time is idle time, so I can argue, if I'm going to be like that, that I'm not even stealing real time. I'm stealing time you weren't doing anything. I'm stealing your resources that you're paying for, and I'm using it to, to enrich myself. Um, so that's a lot of what is going on here. And as you can imagine, it's, it's, um, it's something that more and more entities are pursuing. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll add on to that. You know, people are effectively outsourcing their crypto mining to your business, to your network, your CPU, your, your bandwidth. And, 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 and there's even the factor of power, power utilization. And, and it could even be argued that uh, crypto mining could shorten the life of your network hardware. And you haven't, even, mm -hmm. you haven't even approved of it, and yet you have other people that are using it for potentially for ill-gotten gains, if not for just to make their, their own profits without your permission. So I, I think that's where the real rub comes in. I, interesting stat. Um, they say that about 5% of the Monero cryptocurrency in circulation was mined via cryptojacking which it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so is crypto jacking then a security breach? And Andrew, can you start? Right, so a breach, you know, we tend to think of breaches as someone broke in and did some stuff in your, in your you know, took things or are, you know, in other ways depriving you of something. But... If someone broke into your apartment, opened the door, stepped across the threshold, and, and left, and did not ransack anything, but you knew that they had broken in, would you say, well, they didn't actually do anything, so it's not a break-in? Uh, you wouldn't, right? You would consider the break-in just as much as they rummaged through all of the stuff. Um, it's a breach. They have, they have gotten past whatever your defenses are and are now occupying a space that they don't rightfully have, they, that they don't have the right to occupy and um, and then on top of it, in this case, they are stealing your resources, whether it's power, electricity, especially if it's in the cloud, right? Because you could, even if it were on-prem hardware, uh, maybe it was idle hardware and they're not doing too much there. But, um, but certainly in the cloud, you're paying for all that time, right? Those resources, those instances that are running, you're paying for it. So they're stealing from you to enrich themselves. It's a breach. Okay. And uh, Kevin, I'm assuming you agree, right? You know, I'm going to say yes and no. It's not necessarily targeting security flaws for direct exploitation of sensitive information and, and business assets in the traditional sense, but it does show that your network and your systems are vulnerable to manipulation. And, you know, not unlike mm -hmm. ransomware and even old school malware, the, the crypto jacking threat follows a pretty predictable pattern, not unlike anything else that we've seen. It, you know, it's similar to, to botnets where you know, many computers are compromised with malware and they're in, in, in turn used to launch uh, maybe denial of service attacks against someone else. But uh, the, the, you know, crypto jacking is carried out by an attacker getting someone to click on a malicious link. They then load the malware onto the computer or the attacker injects malicious code into an ad or or a web page that's vulnerable. But either way, this code ends up handing off the crypto mining duties to the victim system. And, and there's an interesting caveat here that uh, I, I do a lot of work around HIPAA. And, you know, looking at it from the perspective of the HIPAA security rule, you know, the High Tech Act, the omnibus rule and all that stuff, they, they define a security incident as, it, it, literally, I'm reading it from the, the definition from HHS, it's called the, it, it's, it's the attempted or successful unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, or destruction of information mm -hmm. or interference with system operations in an information system. And according to that word interference, you know, it could be argued that cryptojacking actually is an incident. So I, I think this is going to have to play out in the courts, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be surprised to see some legal cases related to crypto jacking attacks and then, you know, subsequent compliance related sanctions. I and, think and that's so. a good point. Oh, go ahead. Please go ahead, Andrew. Sorry about that, Karen. But that's a good point because take, for instance, a denial of service attack. The person may not get in, right? They may not cross the threshold on your network. 
but they've right. interfered with the normal operation of your network. And so that right. would still be considered a security incident. Um, it, it's, it's, it's definitely nuanced, right? And, and how you would spin your incident <clears throat> notification to your customers would be different, right? You might not have to say, hey, we lost these accounts or we lost these credentials or whatever, but it, it's still something that, um, that would have to be dealt with, remediated, communicated to a certain significant constituents. It's, it's, um, it, and that's why we kind of want people to pay attention to it. It is important. You can't just brush it off as, well, they didn't take anything. Right. I think also the fact that, you know, so much of security is teaching users, teaching end users about behaviors that are dangerous. And so we were talking uh, before we started our call about the fact that the Android users are actually downloading um, Fortnite instances that, you know, obviously Fortnite's not out on Android yet, um, Fortnite instances that are specifically set up uh, for cryptojacking. So I, I would say, you know, anything that is going to be something that you actually have to teach your users about because they are going to end up allowing unintended access, I, I think it definitely is a security breach. Good point. Okay, well, let's go to our next question. So this is an interesting one. What fuels the crypto jacking threat? And Kevin, are you up now? Yeah, I think so. Right. <laughs> I can be. Um, you know, I, I think it's people. It's people. It's money. It's it's the stuff that makes the world go around. You know, pe people such as hackers. It could be legitimate marketers. It could be cryptocurrency miners. It's, it's even your very own users. Karen, you mentioned... The, the user component to it, and I, I think that's huge. You know, we, we often look past um, the, the very behaviors that are taking place that are creating security risks in our own organizations, and we, we've got to blame it on someone else. Yeah, surely it's, it's somebody else's fault for creating all this, but in, in many cases, it, it's the, the enemy is on the inside of your network, and really all it takes is one of those catalysts, one of those threats combined with a vulnerability to end up creating tangible business risks. And, you know, these, these could be vulnerabilities like uh, lack of endpoint security controls. It could be a website with cross-site scripting or similar flaw that, that lets attackers inject code to facilitate this whole thing. It could be a, a gullible user with an unpatched web browser. Um, those those uh, are, are out there in every enterprise. Um, a lack of network visibility. You could see something like that, that, or you could see, you could experience a crypto jacking exploit. Um, the threat could be right there, right before your eyes. But but if you don't have good network visibility, if you don't have the proper endpoint controls, you don't have good information. You're not going to know uh, that it's actually happening. And Andrew, I, I know we had talked a little bit about you know sort of what was behind this, and I, I liked your this idea of just greed. <laughs> so can you elaborate? Right. So it's interesting. I'm looking at the at the um, the slide and the back pic. This is an awesome picture, right? The picture explains what's fueling the threat. These guys, there, there's money, there's transactions to be had in here. Um, Crypto jacking is essentially the maturation of ransomware, right? Because it's using the same vectors. It's essentially the same kind of thing. But rather than holding up people for money in a very unsophisticated thug approach, um, you do it in, in a sophisticated um, uh, skimming embezzlement approach, right? So it's the difference between... Um, grabbing all the people as they go down from your office into the into the parking lot and and carjacking them right uh, or skimming off the top through some other kind of mechanism um like let's say uh what you see with um the skimmers at, at gas stations right it's different it's a sophist it's a more sophisticated um attack approach and if you look through our history at all of the classes of external attacks that we faced in, in the business realm and later in the, uh, for home, com, um, home users on the internet, it went from a noisy version to a quiet version. You started with all of the website defacement and then you started to see them take advantage of being able to get onto a machine to do um, ads and, and spam. 
all right? We went from the very noisy ransomware to this more sophisticated, you know, I can't get as much money up front on day one, but over time, I'm going to get more money. And as long as, as these cryptocurrencies have value in a market, you're going to see that it's going to be valuable to own them. And if you can own them using other people's machines, other people's equipment, other people's um, compute resources, um, then people are going to want to do that because that's how they are. It, it, it is definitely a, a greed environment where I can just get more. And, and for those who have a shell of a conscience left, I can talk my way into the fact that I'm not hurting anyone else. I'm not taking their stuff, not doing X, Y, and Z. It's not harming them. I didn't destroy their network. They can still operate their business, right? Right. So it's more noble than the than the CEO compromise type scenarios where people are transferring their account their their accounts um, bank accounts into somebody else's. I'm just causing you to generate my money for me. Great point. Uh, okay, so let's go to our next question. And let's see. So who needs to worry about the crypto jacking threat? And um, why don't we start out with Andrew? Well, I think, you know, Kevin has, has indicated different ways in which it happens. And, you know, just to reiterate a few, um, someone – you use a phishing attack to get someone to install something. Um, you set up because of a vulnerability on a web page. You put in some scripts that uh, cross-site scripting attack. Um, you uh, take advantage of people's desire to get things that are not ready to be gotten, um, and they download fake apps, and that that fuel this. Uh, so those the recipients of those attacks are clearly any business or any user, right? So corporate users are vulnerable to this, but corporate users have home machines. Home machines are just as effective, especially, you know, not many, not everyone turns their machines off at night. People don't necessarily worry about that. Machines run consistently. Um, so any machine that's on, right? A, a crypto jacker, is not looking for a special kind of person to run his stuff. The only thing he or she cares about is that that person has a machine that runs. That's all. And if I have enough machines, I don't even care about their relative performance. I just need to take whatever um, level of performance that I can get. So we all need to worry about the crypto jacking threat. Certainly businesses, that are um, that are in regulated industries because otherwise you'll be seen as having a breach. It it can be bad for your reputation, um, but everyone's going to pay for it in some way or sh shape or form. So we all need to worry. I, I think it's it's pretty interesting that you mentioned that you know this idea of people working from home. Uh, at the end of last year, Gallup came out with a poll, and the results said that 43% of people reported working from home at least part of the time during the week. Um, so that's a big deal, and that's, that's a huge, huge, huge risk for everyone in IT who has to protect, uh, you know, protect, the, protect the, home, the home base. So, um, Kevin, can we hear from you now? Yeah, it's interesting uh, that the quote or the statistic you just had, Karen, the, I, I'm actually seeing, we're seeing in the headlines more and more, a lot of organizations are pulling their users back into the office you know, instead of working from home. And I, I can't imagine that security is behind that. Uh, I think it's more of a productivity, collaboration, uh, monitoring kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. Um, Andrew's right. People are expedient. They're going to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, you know, whatever the path of least resistance is. And, and, and that goes for your users. It goes for executive management. It goes even for the – the uh, the people that are launching these crypto jacking attacks. So, you know, lo looking at the bigger picture, it's really the same as any other threat. It's who, who needs to be who needs to worry about it. Who needs to be involved? It, it's business owners. It's executives. It's IT and security staff. Um, arguably, internal audit, risk management, legal, even um, 
your your users and consumers at home that this is a computer security problem and it's you know the one that ultimately uh, will, will will play itself out. It'll have a it could could have a lasting effect on people's wallets and bank accounts and, and potentially even the economy. Uh, but it, but it could certainly impact your your business, your computing resources, your bandwidth, uh, the, the lifespan of your systems. Um, some of, some or all those may not even be a concern for you, but it is something that you need to be thinking about. So it's. Uh, it, it, I think this underscores why, you know, when you're talking about information security and IT, you need to get all the right people on board and you need to keep them on board. It's, this is not just an IT-centric problem, uh, you know, not unlike mm -hmm. ransomware or really any other type of security threat. You need to get all the right people on board so they can get all the right information and make informed decisions in, in order to minimize the impact down the road. I also think you have to really be thinking about the infrastructure. I know, Kevin, you and I have talked in the past about how, you know, the whole idea of ethical hacking and, and fishing your own employees to change behavior and, and training uh, training employees. But at some point, this isn't – this is something that is going to be very difficult to teach employees about. It is. It is because it's – I mean, you know, a lot of IT people haven't even thought about it, or they're still wrapping their heads around it. And yeah, so it's it, we're at the we're at the ground level of you know teaching about this, what to do, what not to do. But but again, it all kind of goes back to some of those basics of you know associated with phishing, malware protection, endpoint protection, network visibility, and all that. So I, I it, it, at least it sort of falls under the the, the same familiar umbrella that we're used to. Andrew, anything else to add? Uh, yes, a point, you know, I like what you both mentioned here. You know, it, if you think about it, there are only two types of attacks that are very specific, that are targeted, right? Um, advanced persistent threats tend to be targeted where someone sought out an environment and decided to get a foothold in there. Um, and then spear phishing, which is designed to hit a certain set of people who have access to a certain set of stuff, whether it's authority or, or you know, I need credentials, and so I'm targeting admin users. But most other attacks are not based on who you are or where you are or what you're doing. They're based on availability of, of systems, right? A lot of these things are scripted in their blanket. So you, as, as defenders of the network, we have to understand that it, you can't say things like, well, oh, my organization doesn't do X, therefore we shouldn't be a target. A, a script doesn't necessarily know that or care, it, right? It just cares that you have a machine that has the right port, that has the wrong software, that, has, that is on the Internet, that has people, enough people coming to it, whatever those regular criteria are. And then you have to, you'll have to deal with the ramifications of that. So we really need to look at it not from the perspective of am I likely to be hit by this, but, you know, what will I do when I am hit by this? Do either of you think that we'll see a lot more of these hackers targeting Internet of Things? Uh, because, it, you know, we've had such issues with IoT devices and security to begin with, and now, you know, they're, they're just such an easy target. Absolutely, I, I think it's, uh, it's it's just any other computing resource. It's you know the, these are systems that that may or may not be running you know common operating systems like uh, Windows and Linux. They they could be vulnerable to uh, crypto jacking. They you know they certainly have resources and they're uh, to, to to utilize and they're probably not being monitored. They probably don't fall under the same mm -hmm. uh, purview of of the rest of the network. So yeah, if if anything that that you know, IoT might be a, a an even bigger long-term target because the bad guys know that that in many situations, uh, IT and security teams are not m managing those systems, and, and heck, they may not even know about them. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah, think about it. Right back in the day, we always used to make the complaint: the OS wars. Oh, this OS is more insecure than this other one. Oh, you're yep. just saying that because this one has more volume. But now when you throw IoT into the mix, volume is massive every time these class of devices have come up, right? So 
you, you said common, they may not have common OSs. And that's true. They, they probably are using, uh, many things are going to be using some form of, of Android or some form of, you know, they, they, they're going to try and use things that exist. But once you start making a million devices that have that, that's a, that's a good, um, that gives you enough of a threshold to learn it and attack it, right? It's, it's worth your time now. It's not like a thousand devices that you're not sure right. where you'll find them. It's like a million devices. Okay, I'll, I'll put some time into that because for the, all of the reasons you mentioned, not monitoring, not necessarily under that kind of control, deployed, ad hoc, it's worth me doing it because whatever I put there is going to stay there for a while. And if I can't even do crypto on it because maybe the processing is too weak, I can use it to do spam or the spear phishing in order to get the crypto. Jackson, done. Good point. Yep, you're right. So we talked about the problem and what it is and why, and who has to worry about it. How do you defend yourself against crypto jacking? Um, and I think who – I think it's – is it Andrew, your turn? It's Kevin's turn. Uh, thank you. Kevin. <laughs> I will go first. Um, you know, for, first and <laughs> foremost, you have to find out where you're weak. That's, that's something that a lot of people haven't yet done or they're not doing it off enough or well enough. And so you have to find out where you're weak, and then you've got to do something about it. And, you know, the, the end point should be the focus r rather than – layering on yet another fat client or heavy control on your workstations or even your servers or your IoT systems, um, you, you can look at cloud-based security solutions. You know, they're quicker to deploy. You can uh, minimize latency. They can be integrated with other business functions that impact the endpoint, such as email. So, so you're fighting the fight from all the right angles where the attack is focused. Um, and, and you've got to do this. You've got to focus on Again, where that risk is, where that vulnerability is, and you're going to have to leverage technology to help enforce your security standards and your policies. Um, you know, you're going to have to make sure that your documentation and processes are fine-tuned. You're going to have to perform ongoing vulnerability and penetration testing and, and even higher-level risk assessments. And you're also going to want to make sure that your users are properly trained and, and, and you know, make sure that they are on board with what you're trying to accomplish uh, with with this type of malware, and you know, e you need to make sure that everything is documented in a well thought out incident response plan. Something that is often missing in security programs and, and IT uh, programs. It's you, you you've got to have a flight plan. You've got to be able to fall back on something for uh, for when the the going gets rough. Andrew. Amen. <laughs> I think one of the there are two key things in in this. Um, in, in our previous question, Kevin went over the different areas in which um, he went over the different areas in which the, the gaps are missed, right? So there's insufficient monitoring, um, not protected at different layers, um, lack of inventory, not knowing that things are out there. There are two key things that, you, that have to be done from a program standpoint um, that if you don't do them, you're going to have problems. The first is defense in depth. We've been saying it for a decade, but increasingly um, organizations want to spend less money. It's like, hey, I bought a tool that does X. That other tool looks like it does X plus Y. Why do we need the X part of that tool? Get a, you know, we're, we're spending too much on X. Let's just you know, get an X, get a Y, and, and we've covered all the bases. And so that's one. Defense in depth needs to be understood. You can't track everything easily from only one place. You need to get a triangulation. You need to see that from more than one place. Um, so that's one piece. Uh, the other piece is we have to understand that visibility is key. Um, we saw a number of incidents as we were looking at this. People had problems, uh, the Tesla thing, where they didn't have visibility. And, and, and they were found out accidentally. And then a lot of times, it's someone who's getting visibility for whatever purpose, researcher or whatever, that discovers the problem, right? So it's discoverable, but if you don't have people that, are, if you don't have tools monitoring and you don't have people looking at the results of the monitoring, you're not going to get that. We need to look at things at, as close to the host as possible and as close to the edge as possible. And I know there's all this talk about the edge going away, but trust me, there's only, there are only one or two ways to get to the Internet for any device that's inside. So you figure out a way to be close to that and to be close to the host, 
and you look at what's happening on the host and what traffic am I seeing over here and how do I correlate that. And uh, one quick point to put in, we need to start looking at things from a security perspective in terms of issues, right? If someone complains that their machine is slow or having a problem, we're more likely to think that it's a failing hardware or some other class of problem. We are not likely to think that it's a security problem. And that goes back to what you were saying, Kevin. If you have an incident response plan, you'll know what that means. You'll know what the, the symptoms are. You'll understand that, hey, I'm having a, a technical problem that might have a security implication. Let's have both teams look at it at the same time and rule out which kind of issue it is. Oh, your hard drive's failing. Oh, wow, look at these additional processes running on your hard drive that's not failing. Um, right. We need to be able to do that. And, and if, we, if we look at things as happening in the environment as potentially security incidents, we'll be much further along. You won't have all these news reports where people are like, well, for months this has been going on and we just happened to come across it by mistake. Exactly, yep. If, if you go back to this idea of protecting all of these folks who are either traveling or working from home office or working from remote office, I mean, how do you defend them against crypto jacking when they are not even in the confines of your network? Yeah, that, that's, well, that's the $54,000 question, right? But you, you've got to have good controls. And if, if you are, are allowing people – to access corporate resources uh, from their own systems, from remote areas, uh, things that involve mobile, things that involve the cloud, then you've got to figure out where those gaps are and where those areas of opportunity are, and you've got to plug those holes. And there are ways to do that. There are uh, you know, more traditional security controls, but there's some newer stuff, some cloud-based stuff, some endpoint stuff that can help um, – sort of lock down and, and bring, again, bring those systems under your, your area of oversight and control, and you've got to look for those opportunities. Absolutely. Um, I think that if you have technology that's guarding the host and the guarding the, you know, guarding the endpoint and guarding the perimeter or as close to the perimeter as possible, um, you're, going to, you're going to be able to take care of people that are in the network with the, both layers and people that are out of the network with at least one layer, all right? So you have to have it. If you only put it in one place, you can only protect people in one way, and right. you're not going to be able to see a big picture. Right. Well, Andrew, I think that leads us really nicely into our, our final question, which is where does cryptojacking fit into an overall security program? Um, cryptojacking is just, it, it's in a sense, in a sense, it is the maturation of ransomware, right? It's, it's just a, a more subtle version of let me get control of your machines and run something on it where I can get money in a more direct form than spam. And, um, and so it falls into the class of things I don't want running on my machine that you do want running on, on my machine. And we have to understand all of the vectors. The vectors for crypto jacking are the same as the vectors for the other security threats. Right, ransomware, crypto jacking, um, spam generation, botnet, all of those, you, you, you get infected in the same way, and it's only what the end result of that infection is that dictates what we end up calling it. Right? And so you're, you're, um, you just have to understand that whereas if you get ransomware, right, the response to ransomware is almost always some update in processes, procedures, and technology, right? Hospital X, um, financial firm Y runs into this problem. You hear about it in the news, or maybe they, they manage to escape it. And what do you think they do? They might hire someone, but they'll absolutely buy some technology, and they'll make some changes to their policies, and boom, they've shifted. Um, but if they get a crypto jacking, they might not even notice that for a while. Um, will, it, will it cause the needle to move in the same way? Maybe not. So uh, a defender, right, information security professional, IT professional, the organization as a whole, this is not an IT problem, this is not an InfoSec problem, this is a business problem. As a business owner, you don't want your stuff working for someone else when you're paying them to work for you. So as a business owner, you need to make sure that your security pro program is comprehensive enough 
to cover all of these different variants of malware and, and uh, unsolicited use. Great. Uh, Kevin, what's your take? Yeah, great response, Andrew. I, I, I think for the foreseeable future and perhaps even indefinitely, cryptocurrency and blockchain, are, they're going to grow in popularity. And, and with that, crypto mining and crypto jacking are, are going to be a part of the discussion, and you're going to have to be prepared to address it in a methodical and professional way. And That, that said, I, I don't think you necessarily need to carve out any special resources to fight this threat alone. You just need to see it as an extension of your existing threats and vulnerabilities and make sure that you know, whatever security controls, processes, and paperwork you have in place are addressing this issue and, and the challenges that it's bringing to your business. So again, looking at uh, from a broader perspective, looking at the cloud, looking at IoT like we discussed, looking at mobile, home users, um, getting vendors involved. Um, you know, I, I, I saw some uh, uh, a recent announcement by Google that they're going to ban all Chrome browser extensions that involve crypto mining. And, and Apple just this week announced uh, some new restrictions on the use of uh, cryptocurrencies on their mobile devices. Um, so, so you, you've it's it's everybody working in tandem to try to fight the threat but but don't get don't get too sideways and don't get too far off into the weeds this is you know you can treat this as any other risk any other threat and and of course the vulnerabilities that facilitate all of that so just make sure that you um make sure that you acknowledge the issues and and do whatever it takes to uh to address them in a reasonable fashion you know, we just had a question come in from the audience from uh, another Kevin, and Kevin wants to know if if we know the processes to look for that are common to crypto jacking. So, you know, here as we are talking about sort of how it fits into an overall security program, do we know which processes are, are common to crypto jacking? Kevin? Um, you know, I, I, I still uh, I still stand by, um, you know, it, it's all it's all about the basics. It's all about the typical threat. See, you know, there's a there's a catalyst, then there's a vulnerability, and it creates a, a business risk or a you know a, a long term consequence. Um, crypto jacking is not necessarily any different from that. You know, it's um, it, it's about your endpoint security, it's about your users, uh, it involves the threats and, and being able to see those threats and mitigate those threats. Um, it, it's all really just, you know, outside of what we've already discussed, it's, it's to me, it's really no different than, than traditional threats that we face. You've just got to make sure that you have the proper technologies and controls in place to see what's happening because I can assure you that, that uh, most arguably uh, uh the, the all i hate saying that word but a, a lot of the uh endpoint traditional endpoint controls that that we're familiar with are probably not going to be able to help you with this so uh, we we just had glenn chime in saying that he thinks that kevin was asking for names of the windows processes not the business processes <laughs> oh okay <laughs> thanks glenn and uh yeah kevin if that's the case then yeah no that's a that's like saying what do i look for uh, uh it, with a ransomware infection uh or in terms of malware you know you you could reach out to cisco you could reach out to there there i'm sure there's uh plenty of uh of instances i know that there's some some uh crypto jacking related malware out in the wild you could do some research on that and and uh see what to look for but I don't know. I don't know that I would want to get too far off into the weeds chasing down one or two here and there when, when there's a whole uh, slew of uh, potential threats out there that you're eventually going to have to uh, protect against. And I agree with you on that, Kevin, because really most of the crypto jacking is script-based, right? It's uh, JavaScript and, and it's other browser running stuff. So it's not a lot of process-based stuff. It's not gonna. It's gonna fall under what we would tend to call fileless malware, and so um, and it's it's so easy to adjust, right? It is so easy to adjust. So it, it's not. Um, that's why you don't hear a lot about the traditional AV folks blocking crypto jacking, 
right? Because it, it's it's designed already to to bypass that layer uh, very easily. And you know, if you ever look, if you ever look in your browser at how many scripts run when you go to any regular page, you'll see just what a challenge it would be to identify um, a script that is generating that stuff against um, a site that may not fall under any negative, um, it may not be on, on anyone's blacklist yet. Right. Now, over time, some of those things will happen, but initially, um, you know, random company doing random mining and sending that money to random place is not going to fall on blacklist um, on day one. So, gentlemen, we have actually gone over our allotted 45 minutes, but um, if it's okay with you, we could take a couple of questions before we let everyone get back to their day. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. So, um, so I have a quick question here from Raj. Raj says, what are the quickest and easiest security solutions I can deploy to defend against crypto jacking? And, gentlemen, I don't know who would like to go first. Andrew. <laughs> you got you got me. Um, so you know we know that uh, our our host here Cisco has um, a number of cloud-based tools. Kevin mentioned the cloud-based tools early on. You, you definitely want to look at things that are easy to deploy and that are outside of your environment, so that it's harder for them to be affected by any masking or any obfuscation that goes on with the traffic that's on the inside, right? Um, you want to deploy stuff that is as close to the endpoint as possible and as and also as close to the perimeter as possible, however you define perimeter for your particular organization. That's what that's what I'll say. Okay, yeah, Kevin. And I I agree. It's it's you know, looking at solutions, uh it, it's stepping out of that traditional mindset and looking looking for controls that can target uh, the, the endpoint and increase your visibility uh, at the endpoint level and at the network level. And, you know, as we've seen with a lot of stuff lately, I, I'm doing it myself in my own business. My clients are doing it. Everybody's doing it. Moving to the cloud, looking at cloud-based solutions that that don't require, uh, you know, a lot of uh, deployment time, a lot of hassles with setup and co configurations, and they're constantly up to date and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I mean, you, you've got to do what's best for your business, what fits into your best, uh, into your model. Um, you know, I, I would say try before you buy. You know, don't don't assume. Uh, do do that proof of concept like a lot of people do and um, make sure it's going to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and just to remind everyone, you know, it is our Q&A portion of the event, and um, so we I forgot to remind everyone, please ask any questions you may have using that question box on the left side of your screen because if we don't get to your question live, we'll make sure that you get an answer from both Andrew and Kevin after the fact. So let's grab this question. Actually, it was coming in when Kevin was talking, um, and this comes from Jen. And Jen wants to know, what are cloud security solutions specifically, and what are the benefits of us deploying one? Yeah, um, so it, uh, a cloud – go, go ahead, ahead Andrew. Go ahead, Kevin. A, a cloud security solution is one that's operated from outside of your environment, right? So if you have a, a cloud-based uh, anti-malware, as an example, there's a cloud console, so you're not setting up a server in your environment with that console. Um, the hosts are installed on, on the endpoints, but those endpoints talk to some cloud-based, uh, centrally network-based um, location, and they provide feedback about what they're seeing, and they get policies essentially from that location. Um, there, are some, there are a number of pluses to it. Deployment time is, is usually reduced considerably because the hardest part is standing up the server and its little infrastructure to get its, its uh, you know, all of the, the apparatus that it needs to deliver to them. Um, and I'm only talking about one kind. There, there, there are lots of different you know, security solutions that are cloud-enabled SaaS-based. Um, but one of the advantages is if your environment is compromised by malware, a server on the inside could also be compromised, even your security server. I have seen that before in more than one organization where the security server itself was compromised and um, as a result was not doing what, all of what it was supposed to do. That's much harder to do when the, when the security server is really in the cloud 
and only the endpoint piece is, is connected to your devices internally, the cloud piece will say, hey, something is amiss here, and it can continue to give you information whether you are inside or outside of your, your network. Um, those are, are solutions, those are things to look at, um, and as Kevin said, you have to decide what's right for your business and how you go about doing it. Don't want to make everyone, you know, we don't want to make the cloud seem inevitable, even though many people are moving in that direction. That's what we would recommend that you look at and see how it fits and see what the advantages are. Certainly easier to, to do tests and pilot, pilot tests and prototypes. So it's worth a look. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking so much time, and I appreciate you sticking, us, sticking around for the uh, last five minutes. Um, and I'd like to also thank everyone out there for spending time with us as well. Um, if you haven't already, I'd like to remind you to check out that additional resources tab, which is on the bottom right widget, where you can find a link to a 14-day free trial of the Cisco service. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for our special web event, The Latest Threat to Your Endpoint Security, Crypto Jacking. I'm Karen Bannon, and on behalf of Kevin Beaver, Andrew S. Baker, Cisco, and everyone at the Ziff Davis Family of Publications, thank you for your time and have a great day.